When the state Senate convenes for the start of the new legislative session in January, the chamber will include about a dozen new faces from both sides of the aisle. And one of those new members is Republican Dean Murray, who previously spent about seven years in Albany representing part of Long Island in the state assembly. After an unsuccessful bid for the state Senate in 2018, Murray was successful this fall, running on redrawn lines, and he joins us now to talk about his recent election campaign and his upcoming term in office. Welcome to the show, Senator-elect. Hey, thank you, David. Pleased to be here. So after your 2018 loss for state Senate, which was a pretty close race, about a three-point margin, did you think you would ever run for political office again? Well, that's a that's a good question because it, it's one of those yes and no questions. It was still in me. I still had the fire, but it was frustrating. Uh, 2018 was a frustrating year because it, it was one of those years that with the so-called blue wave that came through, it very much felt like your campaign was not in your own hands. Too many times I would go to the doors and they would want to talk about federal issues and Donald mm-hmm. Trump and everything else and, and had no clue of any of the state issues that we were actually running on. And so it felt like you were pushing back against the tidal wave and and it was very, very frustrating. But with that said, I still had the bug. Well, then what was appealing about the 2022 opportunity? Was it simply the emergence of a winnable district that was created by the redistricting process? Was it a certain state issue or handful of state issues that made you interested in running again? What was the calculus? Yes, it it was what had happened in the four years since 2018. I was very frustrated in seeing the change in direction of the state going very, very hard left. Um, And and it was frustrating. So ironically, though, When my chairman approached me to discuss uh, the possibility of running again. And this is the Suffolk County Republican chairman? Exactly. Yeah, Chairman Garcia. Uh, We sat and talked. When when I agreed and and said, yes, I would like another shot at it, it, it was not the district that I ended up running in. It was very similar to the old configuration of the third Senate district. So um, actually, it was considered a a very much Democrat leaning district when I got into the race. They then came back, changed the lines again, and it became a more Republican district. So it was just ironic. Uh, uh, Senator Palumbo teases me all the time and says I won the redistricting lottery with that one. But uh, but yeah, we, we made the decision to run regardless of the makeup of the district because I just felt like we needed change. You talked about a uh, pivot to the uh, left in the ensuing four years. Uh, and the big change uh, between 2018 and 2022 was that the state Senate flipped from Republican control to uh, Democratic control, giving uh, the Democrats control of the state legislature as well as the executive mansion. What in particular, though, prompted you to feel like the state was moving too far to the left as a result of this transition? Was it just about the criminal justice space or or were there other areas where you felt uh, the state had tacked uh, too far away from the the more moderate approach that Republicans had been able to secure as a result of their check in the legislature? Sure. Uh, Obviously, the criminal justice uh, changes and then the public safety was in the forefront. But in addition, I, I think we became, if at all possible, even more unfriendly uh, had a more unfriendly business environment. Um, you remember when uh, when Amazon was going to locate in uh, Long Island City and mm-hmm. bring literally tens of thousands of high paying jobs, and we had elected officials chasing them away, which is absurd considering when you look at us leading the nation in out migration, our our the brain drain we're suffering, we're losing our kids, our next generation, to other areas because there are better opportunities. And then we turn around and chase away a company that is bringing with it six-figure jobs. That just doesn't make sense. And it, and it continues to be. We continue to be one of the worst business environments in the nation. Perfect example recently um, with the unemployment insurance assessment surcharges. You know, we had to borrow from the federal government because it was the state government that shut us down. The businesses had no say in it whatsoever. And yet... The state is now coming to the businesses and saying, not only will you pay back the loan that we had to take to pay unemployment, you're also going to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in interest on those loans. That's absurd. 
the state should have done what the majority of the nation did, the other states, and paid off the loan when there was no interest on it. But we didn't do it. Again, we came down on the businesses and, and put it all on them and punished them for something that was completely out of their control. We do this to business over and over. It must stop. So your election represents uh, some significant gains for Republicans on Long Island in the state Senate. But taking a look at the bigger picture of the state Senate uh, across all of New York, Democrats will still have a very strong hold uh, of the chamber with Republicans now at about 20 of the 63 seats in the chamber. Having gone through a similar proportional minority experience in the assembly, how do you approach this new go around in state government? Is there anything you learned from your past experience that will inform the next two years and possibly beyond? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, there is there is a different your, your job is different when you're in the minority as opposed to the majority. Your job in the minority and what we'll take into the Senate is you need to be the voice to to express opposition to things that that you feel aren't good. You need to be a loud voice to get the discussion going. You can't just let it happen because obviously the other side has the numbers. They can push through what they want. But we, it's our job to be the voice, the conscious, conscience to say, hey, wait a minute, time out. Let's talk about this further. Let's look at the details. Let's look at the ramifications. Will this hurt or will this help New York? We need to be that voice, and that is our job. Uh, and many times in the assembly, I was able to work with members on the other side of the aisle to do just that. So it, it, it's basically the mindset coming in of, of what your job is. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with State Senator-elect Dean Murray, a Long Island Republican. And you made national headlines in 2010 when you won a special election uh, to the Assembly and were widely seen as the first representative of the Tea Party to get into major elected office. How, if at all, has your perception of government and its capacity or its responsibility changed uh, in the ensuing 12 years? That's a, that is really a great question because I really was coming in as an outsider. Um, and unfortunately, while things perspective, um, there are areas where it hasn't changed. Um, and I go back to the the business unfriendliness of New York State. Um, my first people asked me when I first got in office in 2010, what was the biggest surprise or what surprised you the most? I said that we, the most surprise was how many people in elected office in New York State had never signed the front of a paycheck. So to them, it's just numbers. It's not real money. And the effect isn't really felt. They have no idea how you're affecting businesses and entrepreneurs and the long-term effects of some of their policies. Unfortunately, that hasn't changed. But I have learned that you need to reach across the aisle. You need to form relationships. You need to work with your fellow elected officials, regardless of the letter behind your name, um, to, again, sometimes be the conscience and sometimes work together, um, sometimes maybe compromise a bit and work together to do what's best for the people you're representing. Um, I came in with that Tea Party attitude of we're going to go conquer it all and, and change everything. And I learned that it's it's like turning the Titanic. You can make change, but it's it's going to take time and, and it's going to take work. And I'm prepared to do that now, too. Well, yeah, in the Newsday editorial endorsing your candidacy this go around, it, it cites your interest in finding compromise and lamenting the quote unquote stark divide between the right and left. Is there an issue in, in Albany that you think is ripe for, for compromise, that there is some middle ground where Republicans and Democrats should both be meeting somewhere in the middle? Well, obviously, the, the most glaring is that of public safety and criminal justice. That's the one that I think needs the most compromise. Unfortunately, it does not sound like the majority is willing to do this. Uh, so we will continue to have to push uh, to, to make those changes. New Yorkers do not feel safe. 
It's just that simple. Um, there needs to be change to things like bail reform and raise the age. Um, and we need to further discuss proposals like clean slate and elder parole. Um, it's, it's ironic because the bail reform and the raise the age, those two in particular, they started off the ideas behind them, the thought process behind them, we all kind of agreed on. It is when they got into the details and started going way off the chart, too far to the left, is when it went off the rails. And unfortunately, that's because I don't believe there was any collaboration. It was more of a, we're in the majority, we're gonna push through what we want, that's it, and you know, consequences be damned. Uh, I think those are areas we need to sit down and have real conversations, and we need to listen to each other. We also need to bring in the experts and listen to them when they tell us what the ramifications may be. That's how you put together better bills, better legislation, and better government. Well, when it comes to the issue of, say, pretrial detention, is the only acceptable compromise that you envision some sort of uh, dangerousness standard that judges can uh, apply to essentially remand uh, people without uh, an opportunity to be released? Because I imagine proponents of cashless bail would argue that concessions have been made in the wake of the 2019 adoption with more crimes being bail eligible and uh, additional money for, say, implementing discovery reforms. So is it possible that we really already have uh, reached a compromise uh, on this issue? Well, no. And I, and I say that because obviously the voters don't think so either. Um, 49 other states gives judges discretion. We don't. Um, I, I believe that's a start of allowing them to consider dangerousness. Uh, but sorry, Senator, like, why, why do you say that voters don't agree? Because we, we are looking at the pretty much the same size majorities in both houses of the legislature and Kathy Hochul got reelected. Sure. But when you look at the polls on specific issues, it's mm. overwhelming that they're not happy with the current system with bail reform. Correct. And also, we were looking at the closest gubernatorial race since 1994. We're in a state where it's well over two to one Democrat. And yet many of these races were extremely look at the 50th senatorial race, who's technically not been called yet, but will come down to less than 50 votes deciding the race out of 120,000. When, when you look at this a lot of these races, while yes, they still have the numbers, they were very, very close, much closer than a deep blue state probably should be. But I think that's the message from the voters that, hey, let's let's slow down here. I think we're going a little too far to the left, a little too fast. And I get back to let's talk to the experts. Let's get their opinions. Let's talk to the DAs. Let's talk to defense counsel. Let's talk to them and get their input on what could work better instead of just ramming through our ideas. When you talked about the list of crimes that were bail eligible, yeah, their idea of compromise was they added about a half dozen and said, OK, we're done. Well, that's no, that's not it. Uh, you need to look deeper into this and have deeper discussions with the experts. Um, I give you, Are you familiar with Billy's Law? Let's pretend I'm not. OK, Billy's Law was it, it's regarding the, the crime of arson. Um, there was a, a um, assistant chief upstate, uh, I forget his last name, but his name was Billy, and, and an arsonist was arrested for serial arson. The next day he was let out because he didn't qualify because it was a certain level of arson that was considered to be nonviolent. So he was let out. The next day he lit another fire in which the assistant chief Billy perished in fighting that blaze. If he had been held like he should have been, uh, that, that blaze never would have happened. And the reason I bring that up is because when you sit and you look at the levels of arson, it, it, and if you're just looking at it from an outside perspective, the level that he was charged with was because he lit an empty building on fire. So you think, well, that's not violent. He just lit an empty building on fire. But the building's not empty when the firefighters arrive. You see, they have to go in and make sure it's empty. So now it's not empty. Now it is dangerous. Now it could be violent if a firefighter is killed. This, these are the things where if they had spoken to the experts, they would have realized this, but they didn't. They looked at it from their perspective and said, well, that's not violent. So we won't include it. And look what happened. It, it's things like that where it's not as simple, especially if you don't really know 
uh, the process or know uh, what you're talking about as much as the experts. That's why we need to bring them in when we're crafting legislation that'll affect 19 and a half million people. And when you mentioned that the person would have been held, that person only would have been held if they couldn't afford to pay whatever bail had been set, correct? Right. And, and or unless the judge had discretion because it ended up that this guy was truly a serial arsonist. This wasn't by far not the first time he was arrested and charged with arson. Had the judge then determined, hey, you <laughs> listen, firebug, you know, we're going to hold you right now because you are dangerous to the public. Had the judge had that discretion, he likely would have held him. Well, finally, uh, in 2015, you had a now uh, infamous experience with uh, sports radio host Mike Francesa uh, when you called in to make the case for Daily Fantasy Sports uh, in New York. Any chance of a reunion in the future, maybe to discuss sports wagering or the overhaul at Belmont Park? You know, what's funny is that um, when he announced, um, well, let me see, how many times has he supposedly retired? Well, anyway, (laughs) and one of the times he announced he was retiring, I did call in. And we did have a conversation, one more conversation. And he still wanted me to admit that that it was betting. And what I couldn't explain to him is that from a layman's standpoint, yes, it is. From a legal standpoint, because of the skill that's involved, no, it isn't necessarily gambling. So we, we agreed to disagree on that. Um, but that was definitely an interesting phone call. Well, we've been speaking with former state assembly member and current senator-elect Dean Murray. He is a Long Island Republican. Dean, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, good luck. Hey, thank you, David. I enjoyed it. Thank you. your business, agency, or service interested in delivering your message to more than two dozen radio stations statewide carrying Capital Press Room? If so, visit capitalpressroom.org to contact our underwriting team.